Welcome to the Workology podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, gain powerful insights, resources, and perspectives on the industries of human resources and recruiting. Join your host, Jessica Miller Merrill, chief blogger of bloggingforjobs.com, for a 45 minute in depth and no holes barred look into the future of our most powerful business asset, the employee. And now, here's your host, Jessica, with this episode of Workology. Hi, everyone out there, and welcome to the Workology podcast. It's great to have you on our new podcast as part of the Blogging for Jobs and Recruiters Lounge family. We are here today to talk about big data, uh, specifically social data and how it impacts human resources and recruiting. Just got back from the HR Technology Conference in Las Vegas, and there was a lot of conversations and technologies and just a lot of sharing and kind of geeking out around big data and how it impacts us. HR and recruitment. I'm here today to talk with a good friend of mine, Stacy Chapman, and we're going to be discussing social data and how it impacts us in HR. Hey, Stacy. Hi, Jessica. So before we get into to talking about social data, let's talk a little about you and your background because you have a lot of really great experience in the industry that I think has really helped you as you've developed the new technology and company that you're the CEO of. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I'm the CEO at Swoop Talent and we specialize in social data, but the truth is you're right. I've been in HR tech for longer than I care to admit. Um, And across that, I got to work on both the vendor side and the customer side in a bunch of different functions and a bunch of different roles. Um, I've even been an HRAS DBA, if you can believe it. My tech team would die laughing if they heard that. But um, what I get excited about across all of those, whether you're thinking about performance, workforce planning, learning, all kinds of good stuff, what gets me really excited is data and decision making. And I actually think that as an industry, we can do a lot better with both of those things. Well, let's kind of kick things off and and start a little bit, kind of go back to basics. Can you tell us what social data is and maybe why it's important for our industry? So from my perspective, in the world of HR and recruiting, social data is all that varied, spread out, changing data about talent that's in hundreds of places outside your enterprise. Now, that's a reasonably broad definition, but of course, it's a reasonably broad data set. So that's how it rolls. As for why it's important, I kind of hate to say it, but it's important because it's there. We, we can't ignore it. It's growing and it's huge and it has so much valuable information inside it. But to be honest, there are lots and lots of people like at HR Tech who are plugging on how important it is. And I'd like to take a minute, if you don't mind, to talk a bit about a risk or two with it. Absolutely. There's copious data out there about your workforce, your competitors and your labour market. And that's really a fantastic opportunity. But what we need to really understand is it's not like the data we used to work with. And the big difference is in curation or husbandry, if you want to use a word you can have fun with. Um, When we work with data from our HRISs or our LMSs or our warehouses, there are people in play, data folks who have placed controls on the data we have and how it's gathered, how it's collated. Typically, there are processes, procedures, even systems that go some way towards controlling the quality and the completeness of those data sets. And that's just not true with social data. I mean, yeah, social data is seriously promising and and honestly, it is already a fantastic data set that gets the propeller on my head spinning like you would not believe. It's huge, it's broad, it's deep, and it's super accessible. But it's also self-reported. It's got no quality control. It's hugely variant in terms of the structure of the data sets. And the one that I think is most overlooked is that it's wildly incomplete. I see so many people falling into the trap of thinking that the social data sets they can access cover an entire population, and they typically do not. I mean, that's not the end of the world. The thing about shortcomings in any data sets is as you understand them, you can embrace them and work inside them. I just think that if you don't stay aware of what is wrong with it as well as what is right with it, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. Agreed. And and I will say that as an individual who uses social media for oversharing on many occasions, you still don't get a complete picture of an individual because they are selectively sharing information about them out on social media, updating their profiles in all these different places. Right. Or else they're not. 
and it might be that some really important and fantastic people are not out there at all. And I think we got to get our head around all these kinds of different different challenges, let's call them, with the data so we can really do good things with it. Agreed, agreed. And it's interesting, there's a large subset of community members, particularly like programmers and developers in the Bay Area that are choosing not to participate in sites like LinkedIn and these other social networks. And it's because they don't want to be contacted. So I think it's important to understand that that data, like you said, is good, but it's not always complete. Yeah, look, and to that point, I think we're probably going to see the emergence of more walled gardens as well. So we're going to see that people pressure their the social networking sites which they are really interested in. You know, for example, those engineers might pressure sites like Stack Overflow to close it down so that no one else can access it. And I think that's one of the things that may or may not happen that we need to be aware of as we think about the awesomeness of this data set. Because, I, I mean, I still think it's awesome even in the face of three hours I could rant on about what's wrong with it. And I, and I think that you are going to see some engineers that are going to say, hey, we want to close this community and keep it from, from having search. We're, I'm doing a, a webinar. We're talking about sourcing hacks uh, tomorrow on, on Blogging for Jobs. And one of the things that we're, we're doing is some Boolean search with a Google X-ray. So we're pulling from these meetup.com is the example that we're going to be using. We're pulling that data out so that we can source candidates. But oftentimes, many of these candidates it doesn't matter if they're passive or active. They really just don't want to be contacted for job opportunities. And nobody reads the terms and conditions, so they don't even know that when they signed up to meet up, they allowed for that all to be exposed. Well, let's talk a little bit about some ways that companies are using social data. It's not just about tweeting. I, I just I want to make that clear. Like This isn't just about getting on Twitter and, and tweeting a bunch. This is much different. So let's talk about that. Sure. Look, and I think a nice way to split out that, I think that's a really good comment, is that you should think about what's going on with social, whether you're talking about social recruiting, social HR, social whatever, as having an inbound and an outbound aspect. And when you're tweeting is what you're doing, it's outbound, right? You're pushing things out into the social data universe that build, can build your brand, build your credibility, create relationships, do some really powerful things. But on the flip side, if you talk about what I would think of as inbound data, you can also pull a whole mountain of data in. Um, and, and that's sort of much more up my street in terms of what, what I can talk about of being good with it. And the thing about pulling that data in is you can be incredibly specific about what you want to look at because there are so many data points. You can drill down on your competitors, on your critical workforce groups, on yourself and get really laser focused on what you want to know. You know, obviously within the context of what I said before, of there being some shortcomings, but you can do that and also get a really personalized view because you can see your own good self inside this data as well. So you're able to really divide out really specific things. I will say that for fun, and this is my kind of fun, is that for a couple of weeks, I used Twitter where we just pulled data. And, and we were looking for people saying things that were negative. There was a negative sentiment associated with their jobs or their boss. I wanted to see if there was a peak time historically or, or as a trend about where people were saying, I've had enough. Is it Thursday before Wednesday hump day? And actually it was interesting. And I think we did this for three weeks. We pulled the data off Twitter and we found that Sundays at three o'clock clock was the prime time when you, as someone on Twitter, was negatively talking about their boss or their job. Which kind of makes sense when you think about your real life, right? But I think that stuff is really, sentiment analysis is a fantastic analytical tool that, I mean, if you even go back 10 years, imagine being able to do that is like a fantasy back then. And so now you can, not only can you do that sort of sentiment analysis and get to really important data points like your 3 p.m. Sunday, you can also slice and dice it by industry, by location, by, if you integrate it with other sets, you can even do it by skill. You know, people with this particular skill, actually, it's not until five o'clock Sunday that they do it. And you can really do that level of slicing and dicing once you start to be able to combine these sets. And it's not like you even need a unique identifier anymore. I mean, I can match internet records to other internet records without needing any connection between them or needing any unique identifier. And that's really exciting. I mean, imagine what you're going to be able to do with Twitter sentiment analysis. It's, it's creepy, but very cool because you can really nail down very specifically a way to, 
to distribute information to maybe job seekers who are dissatisfied, like in the hospitality industry, if they say they they are angry with their jobs at five o'clock, like you said, instead of three. And if you have a specific geographic region, maybe that's when you're sending things out to the universe and, and really targeting uh, content and just posting information or, or, or sourcing candidates an I- ideal time to be able to contact them about job opportunities. Right. And retargeters are helping us do that as well. So you then you can know that you're sending it out to people who have visit, previously visited your website at five o'clock on some day. I mean, the, once you start to bring the data sets together and the data sets that are available, this is just the ones you can do right now today. I mean, you can micro segment right down to what your ideal employees are, what they're doing from the hour today and all that scary stuff. You can at really in detailed ways analyze your best performing recruitment interventions. Like when I did this particular recruiting campaign, what kind of interactions did that lead to over the long term and how many of them ended up being good performers in critical skill sets? We have the data that we can do that. We can really look at what I call paths to me. How did the way different social interactions bring people to me? And and companies are doing that all the time. You know, how many times did they have to come to the career site before they applied is a really simple example. You can also incredibly detailed competitor analysis. Like you can seriously look at what turnover in your competitors is like now. Again, 10 years ago, we used to have to do secret interviewing to find anything like that out but it's all there for us now so it gets really quite interesting so you can start to see how does your employment brand do compared to theirs and how are they losing people compared to you but you got to remember the flip side of that is they can do it to you as well and that's you know it's not just my organization that has access to it it's all of them and that's even true if you're just talking about direct sourcing the best talent through meetup so every other company can get that so You know, if you're not, you're probably going to be in trouble. I want to back up here and just kind of explain a little bit about what retargeting is. Have you ever went to Nordstrom's and were looking at a certain purse on the Internet and then suddenly you go to other websites like maybe perhaps your favorite celebrity gossip site like I occasionally visit and then suddenly that purse is right there in front of my face and then I go to Facebook and it's there too and then Nordstrom sends me an email and the picture on the top part of the email that I can see from my phone is in fact that purse that is essentially retargeting for the consumers but you can also do retargeting for candidates which is really kind of a cool feature that is picking up steam. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's something that everybody should be doing because when you think about the amount of noise, whether it's from purses or from whatever else we're being bombarded with as we move around, the more personalized and appropriate you are and the more you use data to really get a scalpel-like precision on what you're going to push to who and when, the better chance you have of creating meaningful interactions, right? To kind of get an idea of what that looks like and what the future holds, one of the books that I have enjoyed reading, and and I'm an audiobook person, hence why we're doing the podcast here, so I will sit on the train and and listen to my audiobook and I feel super productive because otherwise I just don't have the attention span uh, to pick up a book or, you know, it's just bulky for books. But uh, the book is Age of Context and Shel Israel and Robert Scoble. It's a great book to just pick up and read to kind of understand um, contextual information and how we're using data to hopefully provide a better, more targeted experience for customers, candidates, or whoever. But that just kind of gives you some insights into the future and what it holds. And and I think it's really important that we read those things. I mean, I think that's a really good point. The word context in itself is so, should be considered in everything we ever do with data. But the other thing about it and about reading some of those more future focused, maybe slightly out there books is that they help you to start thinking about what possibility is. And what I'm really concerned about is that what will happen with what we do with this social data will become vendor driven. And that's happened to us as an industry so many times and we continue to let it happen. And I'm just hoping that as a practice, people will start to focus on what are the really vital and critical questions we need to ask. Because a vendor is going to send you whatever the question they can answer. And that's not... best intentions of a vendor still is not necessarily going to be it. So when people are reading those books, my I would love to see them be thinking about, okay, here are some examples Jessica and Stacey talked about, but what would be the fantastic questions that maybe this data could help answer for me? And I think that's how we'll drive this to be super useful. 
Well, and, and I think it's a good time for practitioners in the space to be able to push back a little bit because there are really interesting startups, companies like yours that uh, are able, I think, to work directly with the practitioner and be able to take that feedback and develop something that's really mean meaningful for those workplaces and particularly the practitioners in the space. Right. Well, I li certainly like nothing better than to steal the good ideas of my customers. But I think that if you think about it as all building towards a really good answer, totally there are so many, especially the younger companies who are just dying to hear from Let's talk a little bit about the sheer amount of data because social media is really overwhelming for people. And let me put it into a little bit of context, speaking about the edge of context. Every two seconds, you have two LinkedIn accounts that are created. And then also you have 11 Twitter accounts that are set up. It is a extremely noisy world. And, and I contribute to that noise. And, and as do you and, and as do we all. Having just been at the HR Technology Conference, the Twitter stream was crazy and it was extremely noisy noisy, but it's really important to be able to pull information from the data that's being uh, just put out there and, and find a way to make it meaningful. So how does one cut through the noise in social media and with social data? I think the first thing that you need to do is to know the data. So rather than the content, think about the data sources as the first step and then the kinds of data that those data sources that can provide to you. I mean, apart from Twitter, I think of data sources on talent in particular as being either generalised or specialised. Now, generalised sources include things like About.me, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, quite a lot. And then and there's stuff you can get from those and they have different values and different benefits and they can provide you with different things. Specialised sites can get even more interesting. So whether it's Dribbble for designers, GitHub and Stack Overflow, that we talked about. There's ZocDoc, there's Nurses Lounge, there's ResearchGate, there's Proformative. I mean, there are so many of the ones that are specialised kind of professional conversation sites for verticals and they provide a different level of depth, a smaller amount of coverage and a different level of depth. But they do it in really different ways too. Like, for example, and I get to watch how people search my data for talent, right? So I will often see people searching for the jo a job titled Java Developer. And I mean, that's, that shows someone who does not understand the data because many of the very best Java developers out there never ever use that expression and most of their activity is on sites where job title is not even used. So if you don't understand your data sources and what kinds of data sets and value they provide, then you're going to lose a lot of value, which is probably even worse than being overwhelmed by too much new too much noise. But if you do step back and have a look at them and then you can say, well, which of these are more valuable so that you can really focus on where you want to look. Um, and then in that, you can start to have a look at what data is there. Like it's not, I think people approach it with, oh, what can I do with this enormous, beautiful, flawed data set? Um, but, but what they really should be doing is, is asking themselves, what do I really need to know and what out there can help me understand it better? So be driven by your needs and your, your needs in terms of questions rather than by the excitement of the bulk of data that's there. Does that make sense? I mean, I think people get seduced by the hugeness of it without thinking about what can I find out. And when you think about data sets like Google Plus and Twitter, there's actually a lot of really good kind of research and examples and studies like the one you talked about with the time that people are most negative that can help you understand what value is there. The flip side is there are a whole lot of people who, you know, because Twitter is what they do, therefore will tell you Twitter is where you should be sourcing for talent. And I think you need to really understand your own context and your own needs to make it be an easier thing to manage. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, while I love Twitter and it is a, a favorite place, it doesn't mean that it's where the place where all my Java developers are going to be spending their time. And, and I think that starts with what you were alluding to in the beginning is research, researching common terms, terminology, understanding the type of candidate that you're looking for, and then kind of tapping into their minds a little bit to see where, what, what sites and, and places they're spending their time and, and sharing. Right. And you can always ask human beings that too. You don't even necessarily need to just ask the Googles. We can talk to human beings and, and have like a focus group and ask them questions. That's, Shocking. that's amazing. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> try that. 
<laughs> but the other thing about it all is that I think people think, you know, it's just like social recruiting and people forget to break, separate between inbound and outbound. You also got to think about the different types of data that are out there. And I think of three key categories. And one is profile data, one is behavioral data, and the other one is relationship data. And those come from and are in different places and different ways, but they each tell you quite important things about the person or the talent in general, in aggregate. It tells you a lot about your labour or talent market. So profile data is who you are, what your skills are, where you are in line. I think most people think about that when they think about it social data but there's also all this interesting stuff in like behavioral data which is like which sites are you on you know how much do you tweet where do you go uh, how do you interact with us and that tells you something a little bit different than what the profile data tells you so you also want to think about in terms of being better at my job is how people behave towards me more important is the profiles more important or is the relationships that they have more important and I think the more that you can get yourself a kind of um construct in which to think about the data, the easier it will be for you to be able to cut through that noise and to be able to suck in those bits of data which are most valuable to your organization. So you're, you're sucking in that bits of data and you're absorbing all this information. So how do you think that all this data and information can help at predicting job seeker candidate and employee activities? Do you, do you have any specific examples? Well, First off, I want to talk about the P word, using predicting. And, you know, I've been in workforce planning for a very long time. And I think that as a practitioner, different to being a vendor or an analyst or a thought leader, as a practitioner, you want to be really careful of the word prediction. You're better off to talk about forecasting or anticipating because the thing about the second you say, I predict, if you are wrong, then boom, your credibility is dead. However, there are ways you can say softer things like the data seems to say X or this profile has a high correlation with Y. So where you're still talking about what the data is indicating and, and, and talking about important data-oriented things, but without ever saying that you are predicting things. And I think that it's, although you may eventually get there, I think that you're able to open a much better conversation with leaders and a better conversation with your organization if you use some of those more softer terms. Um, I think we should try to resist the magic button of predicting until we're really, really good at it. Now, I think I'm hopelessly and utterly in love with the concept and some of the actuality of predictive analytics. But you really, in terms of establishing your own credibility, be very, very careful with the P word. Now, that being said, I really believe it can help you make better decisions about hires and about all kinds of things associated with talent. It's nascent. I mean, it's very early days yet. But if you think about how you as a human interact online and try and visualize the data set that is out there about you, it tells other people a lot about you. And that gives you some sort of insight into what kind of things that data tells you about other talent as well. I think of it as being kind of your online body language, as well as what you might reveal in your LinkedIn profile, you reveal an awful lot more about yourself in other areas. So you're going to end up with this really broad picture of people, but as I said before, not all the people. And as with all data, you've got to understand in this, you're making huge assumptions about people. People who, as you said before, Jessica, could be faking everything online. You're making huge assumptions about how representative your data set is. Now, the thing about decision making is you always make assumptions. 100% of the decisions you make contain assumptions. And that's okay. It's just that the more you're aware of your assumptions and your biases, the better you're able to make your decisions. So like I'll throw you an example that we were talking about earlier. GitHub and Stack Overflow as a sources of data about computer programmers or Meetup. I mean, I get excited about these things. It's fantastic data to be had there, but they're not complete data sets. There are whole subsets of the programming community who just don't use them at all. You know, so, and that's totally okay. It doesn't mean that it, you can't get fantastic help in your decision making from them. You just got to be aware that there are shortcomings, and that's hugely risky. That makes the P word even riskier in here because your data sets, there's a lot of assumptions in play, and and the more the assumptions, the less likely you are for accuracy. So soften it up. And as for the term big data, I just 
I'm just so over it already. Um, you know, like veracity and velocity are not typically in play in our, so if you go back to the purest definition of big data, it doesn't even really play here. So I think, again, and it'll also hurt your credibility. As a practitioner, dial that hoopla back and just call it data. The reality is data of all sizes has got enough awesomeness for you to be able to work with, right? Agreed, agreed. I, I want to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago when you were talking about how people can fake an online persona. And that is actually a real thing. And, and earlier this uh, week on blogging for jobs, and I'll link to it in our uh, resource page on, on the podcast. But if you just go and search to, I would say that the title of the blog is why a recruiter is the second most important role at your technology company. There is a CEO of a startup actually that's based in Silicon Valley. Her name is Elaine Wary. And so for a period of two years, Elaine created a fake persona of a JavaScript developer and posted a website, social media profiles. His name was Pete London. And so she was trying to find who was the best recruiters. And the thought was, if you were a really good recruiter, I want to see if you can figure out if Pete is fake. Also, interestingly enough, she was able to see, and she actually details it in her blog uh, quite nicely, she's able to see that how many people try to poach Pete. So they would call into her organization and say, hey, Elaine, we've got somebody for you. We have a great guy. He's going to be awesome for JavaScript. And then not more than five minutes later, they would try to connect with the fake profile Pete and say, hey, we've got a gig for you. Uh, And so that helped her discern who she wanted to work with as far as recruiters. Interestingly enough, out of the 382 recruiters who contacted her over the course of two years, only one of them actually realized that the profile was in fact fake. I hope she hired that one. She she talks about it. It's, it's quite fascinating. It was uh, one of my f- favorite kind of blogs that I have uncovered as I'm sort of looking more and, and doing a lot more research into, t- into technical recruiting because that is a, a complete other animal uh, on to its own. But it is, it is easy, relatively easy speaking, to fake uh, an online persona. And there was a woman recently in the news that had faked as part of her college, I guess, a, a project that she was on vacation. For like two weeks, she was on a European vacation and she went so far as to Photoshop pictures of tropical fish into a swimming pool. So she posted on Instagram. Yeah, I I did read about that one. And she even hid from her family while she was in the small town in which she lived. It was an interesting experiment. And it's you're so right. I mean, you don't you can't the veracity or trustworthiness of the data is relatively low. I mean, we had a settlement recently where a vendor had to settle with LinkedIn for having programmatically created thousands of fake profiles in order to collect data. I mean, there's lots of stuff that could be wrong, but I worry sometimes that people will use these examples not to learn from, but to close the door on. And I think we need to be really careful not to do that. Because the reality is if I dug deep enough in your HRIS, I could find a whole lot of stuff that's wrong in there too, right? True, true, true. Well, let's let's talk about a little about your HR technology company, Swoop Talent, and, and what it does specifically. Talk, talk us through that. Sure. We actually suck up a lot of this social data. So we have crawlers going everywhere across all kinds of different places, sucking up social data, and we build what we call aggregated social profiles of people. So rather than looking at a meetup profile, I'll be looking at you and the data that is on meetup, GitHub, about.me, all kinds of different places all in one place. Now, we only hoover up professional data. We're not interested in drunk photos and likes, but we've got like 160 million folks in there now with data coming in from hundreds of sites and it's structured data, unstructured data, all kinds of things. Like we actually tend to have tenfold more data on our customers' workforces than they have because that's how much more data is available outside the enterprise now. So for a long time, people have been using our data set for sourcing. But what's getting more exciting now is that we're privately integrating customer data from all kinds of different internal places to this social data. So they're starting to get the full picture both in, inside and outside the house in order to be able to better understand what they're doing. And we're doing some really good data visualizations, which you're going to love. I have to send them over to you. I mean, there are a few things in life I love more than a good Venn diagram. And if you can think about the Venn diagrams that can be done on the combination of your internal systems and the external sites, it's really awesome. 
So we're back working with a bunch of groovy companies on wrangling and unifying all of their varied internal data and then unifying that with all the external data as well as a data set from which they can start to make better decisions about talent. So it's actually getting really, really pretty awesome. And that gives you such a better picture of everybody in your workplace because we don't just leave the office and shut off the office just like when we go to work we don't just shut off our personal life so there's a whole other piece pieces of what we do and, and what we don't do and who we spend our time with and um, I, I, that's becoming more and more I guess problematic or an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity, I guess, for companies to to really better understand and engage their employees as well as candidates. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, and I think that the important thing, and I think Google's done a really quite nice example of showing that, is is being really transparent about what you're doing and really thoughtful about it. You know, I mean, we real, I, you really don't want people who bring up your Facebook photos. That's fine, and neither do I think that employer necessarily should should do that at all. But when it comes to being able to make decisions about whether they should target you for an opportunity in a new project that's happening in the organization, the skill data, like it might be that you are attending meetups about a technology that you're really interested in and it turns out another part of the company is starting to do a project on, then that bit of data that you go to that meetup might be all the company has to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, do you want to be part of this project? So there's a lot of mutual benefits from a lot of the interesting data that's out there. But and it's not all that, that obviously is expressing an interest that is not necessarily in the current work. So the HRAS could never have it. So if you start to think about what the possible examples of that data are, are really good. But people get really quite panicky about how, oh, you know, we can't get that data because it's personal and, and it'll just be my drunker logs and whatever else. But it's you can, if you're really transparent and you're thoughtful about it, I think what you can do with that data to to empower your workforce and to help them to grow into better and more interesting places could be really sensational. I think that that's an important point to bring up. I mean, I, I think about myself and the number of data scientist meetings that I've been to recently on meetup.com and other places where I, to be able to learn and understand something that's completely outside of, although I see, you know, how it fits into our world, but typically completely outside the human resources and recruitment space. But you wouldn't get that if I was HR director at a company and know that I'm, this is what I'm doing on my evenings and weekends. And, and certainly my boss or my boss's boss might not understand why that would be important. But in certainly in the bigger picture of the organization, somebody in another department might say, hey, I need this person with the skills and these interests. Oh, here's somebody that uh, Jessica is, is obviously really interested in this particular area of the business. We should speak with her. Right. And it could save you a lot of time and money and get you a more passionate, more committed team than you ever imagined you could have. Yeah. And instead of going external to make that hire, you're using your resources internal, which I thought it was certainly another, and, and it's typical. I mean, I, I think it makes sense that suddenly now that the economy has improved, we would, we would go back to thinking about retention and development and engaging our workers versus, you know, laying them off and, and just giving them more work. It's kind of the normal, uh, you know, I guess the way things work in the workplace. So we want to keep our people engaged and employed, the ones that understand the business and are happy there. Right. And, and I think that it's, you know, it's about how you take it and what you do with it as to whether that's where you go with it or you go to being afraid of it. And, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see who comes out. But the truth is a really large organization only has data in order to, to cast across itself and look there. And most internally, most organizations really don't have much good data at all. So it's a shame. Well, let's take a little bit of a reset here. I, I know Stacey and I could go on and on and on, but I just kind of want to reset and let you know that you're listening to the Workology podcast. Today's topic is social data with my guest, Stacey Chapman. Stacey is one of the leading experts on workforce planning. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Obviously, she has a lot of passion for the industry. You can hear it in her voice. I just love being around her. I feel smarter every time I'm just in the room. Um, I also have a really great time. Secondly, like she's just a fun person to be with. But you've spoken all, all over the world and, and obviously you have a lot of knowledge. You've worked with a lot of large enterprises and organizations in a lot of different areas of human resources and recruitment. How does social data play in the overall landscape of the workforce planning? Um, and what can we do as far as companies to keep from feeling overwhelmed? 
it's a good question. I mean, some people might say that I have so much experience in workforce planning that I had the sense to stop doing it. But the thing about the social data, actually, I think is quite exciting. There are two powerful and relatively simple things that come to mind. One is the change it makes to labour market data. Now, with all the caveats I said before, and the conference board has a really fantastic paper on this quite specifically, but it used to be that labour market data had real shortcomings in terms of its lack of granularity. It's very plausible, it's very believable, very accurate, in many ways, fantastic data set, but you can't really necessarily slice and dice it and you can't see where you sit in it. And if you use social data in balance with the what I would call the real labour market data, then you have a much more instant and much more slice and diceable picture of your labour market. And understanding your labour market can be a really good foundation to know where you should focus in workforce planning. And the second one is the skill data. I don't know if you've ever worked with companies that do competency management or try and implement that. That stuff demos really well, but in the real world, there are typically not incentives in order to demonstrate what your real skills are. Now, in the social data world, it you can't necessarily find skill data in all verticals, but in some verticals, it's really fantastically good and it's peer reviewed and it's really important, but you're getting to have skill and job data that is much, much richer than you've previously had. And I think using that as a basis for analysing and calculating is going to be really good. Again, using that data to stimulate good conversation and to stimulate decision making, not to attempt to predict or to have the final answer. But as long as you have that kind of open viewpoint of it, you're going to do much better with executive engagement and with getting decisions made, which is ultimately what workforce planning is for. I just want to throw in here and just mention that when it comes to social data and social media, it's not just a bunch of 25 year olds that are on Facebook or Snapchat. There's a lot of growth in other demographics. And I think that's important to point out. Well, one of my good friends, Jeannie Meister, who writes for Forbes, she's the author of the 2020 Workplace. Great book. You should check it out. She it recently published an article about the fastest growing demographics on Google Plus, which is, I mean, I, I'm not on Google Plus, but some people are. But uh, it's 45 to 54 age range. And then Twitter is 55 to 64. So it's not just a bunch of crazy kids who are who are on these social networks. People are sharing information in uh, all across ages and uh, experience levels and uh, nationalities and backgrounds. I, I, I want to just mention briefly, too, that we're gonna, I want to talk a little bit about wearables because I think that this provides a lot of social data in the way that you no longer have to be relying on your mobile device to be sharing. I'm a Google Glass user and, and what a, some people refer to as a glass hole. And this wearable tech allows you to be in the moment. And I, I call this the performance of now, but I was just curious for your opinion, Stacey, how important do you think or this wearable tech is, is going to be adding to more, I, I'm assuming, better data uh, for us to be able to make uh, business decisions. You're getting into behavioural data many times here that I think people are concerned about. Obviously, there's been a bit of a fury about privacy and, and all that good stuff. I think that will work its way through. But I think all of these things, whether it's mobile or wearable, we shouldn't think of them as being a separate thing or a separate function to what we do. You know, it's like when we move to mobile, it's no different than, really than when we move from client server to the internet. It just becomes how we do a heck of a lot of things. So I think that although wearables are, adoption, I suspect, will be quite a bit slower than mobile. Could be wrong, but I suspect aside from quantified self movement, it'll be a little bit slower. But it is, it, it's just going to be. And I think people need to understand that it is going to be and it will evolve to be and try and stay on top of what some of these trends are. Um, you know, I'm not a big user of wearable tech or anything like that, but I do think that in some way or form it kind of has to happen, whether it's glass holes or smartphones. And I think that we just need to stay right on top of what it does mean in terms of data, what concerns that our employees may have about our use of that data and how transparent we are and whether we are thoughtful about what we do with it. And the same is true for all data. But I think hmm, those things are going to happen. They're just going to be a different way that we do what we do rather than some new thing that we do. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think about the health aspects of, of wearable devices. And obviously you mentioned the like fitness, it's more than just steps, but I like to look at my sleep patterns and, you know, obviously I'm, I'm sharing that within my network or these different places and that could be used to lower healthcare costs for you and, and your employer. And, and, in those cases, I, I think that it's a win. I just, I'm thinking about the amount of information, especially people who have wearable devices, obviously their, their user adoption rate is, is higher and probably the amount of data that they're sharing is much higher. So once again, it's kind of noising up uh, all that data and, and maybe keeping us from, from finding those uh, folks who are n- not as active on the social networks or are not into sharing every little piece of their lives. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. But I think, I mean, it's, it's another point of where you need to think, what do I need? And how does that fit in the potential of this in order for its ability to answer my questions? And those caveats about privacy and concerns are always going to be there, you know, and and as whether it's quantified self or whether it's Internet of Things, you know, whether it's data that's coming from my devices about my devices to other devices, people are, I think we're seeing more focus on the concerns around privacy. And I think the only way to get over that is transparency. So stay on top of all of it and and look to experts who can help you. I mean, you don't need to be a first-person expert on all this stuff. You just need to have a bit of a BS filter when you look at the experts on it. <laughs> BS filter. I love it. I love it. I, I definitely think that it's it's important to do your research and do your homework because there is a lot of noise about this. And sometimes it's just for the sake of of posting an article to to drive traffic and awareness and suddenly it's completely I don't know exploded and it was it was it didn't need to be it's not something uh, on on your radar like like for example Google Glass there are not that many people who are wearing it at work and yet it has been dominating the news Uh, privacy concerns and yet it's not even available for sale for for public consumption there was a scarcity factor in play there though Oh, yeah. I bought into it. Absolutely. And uh, while I I wear them at conferences, I don't normally wear them. I mean, it's just not something that I need. I want to get away from my email. Right. I don't want to be sucked into the black hole. So I don't I don't need more. You know, I recently gave up Facebook. So I I think we're going to see people coming in and out of, let's call it these data sets, but we're going to be coming in and out of these data sets more and more. I mean, as people take breaks from whatever it is, whether it's that you're at a conference or you just want a month off. And that's okay. It's another, if we know what these trends do to the data, we can use that, be aware of that in the making of our decisions. And it just means I have to email you. That's right. Or telephone, you know, human conversation. It's not yet dead. Oh man. Yeah. You're that, that's a, that's a hard one for me, but I, from time to time, you know, we make time for, for human interaction, maybe uh, having a drink or meeting for dinner. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I want to thank you, Stacey, for taking time to, to be on the Workology podcast. Where can people go to, to find more out about you? Well, swooptalent.com is obviously the best place because that's where I live now. But I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn and about.me and Meetup and all those places. I, um, as I, I hinted before, much prefer the long form conversation like this. But feel free, anyone can feel free to reach out to me to talk more about any of this stuff. Uh, you have any questions, contact my contact is through a thousand ways. Isn't it for everyone? So she is easily found. I want to thank you for joining the Workology podcast hosted by me, Jessica Miller Merrill, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace HR and recruitment. Until next time, you can visit Blogging for Jobs to listen to all of our previous podcast episodes with Workology. Thanks, guys. Production services for the Workology podcast with Jessica Miller Merrill provided by...